You're listening to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Thanks, as always, to our partners for helping us bring you awesome developer pods each and every week. Shout out to Fastly.com, Fly.io, and Typesense.org. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. Hello, JS Party people. Welcome to this week's JS Party, a party about JavaScript and the web. I'm K-Ball. I am your host this week, and I am joined by two of our favorite, not always regular panelists. You got, y'all, I think, are semi-regulars at this point. Amel Hussein, let's start with you. Yeah, hi. She's calling me out. You know, I, I, I was regular. I just decided to, like, be flaky for a few months. So, you know, hope to hope to be back on regularly again. But hello. Hello, everyone. That's what I'm aiming for here. Yeah, he's just, just calling us out. Lay it out as a challenge. Regular once again, starting this week. Amel Hussein and Chris Boneskull Hiller. Hi. My excuse is that I have depression. Mm, that's That's real. The JS party music isn't lifting you up? No, man. It's bad. All right. Well, let's see if this topic helps or hurts for your depression, Chris. Uh, We are talking today about dev processes. What are the things that we do and the trade-offs that we make to make our lives better as developers? And I thought maybe we could start with one that I've, I've heard from a number of different folks, which is around PR etiquette, best practices for PRs, different places we could go. And y'all are coming from different backgrounds. But when I say that, a really good PR, in your mind, what does it look like? What are the attributes? So, okay. So I like PRs, you know, despite the depression. But the PRs, they should have a description. Like, number one, when I see a PR, when it doesn't have any description in that PR, that's usually from like some other maintainer. And I'm not going to name names, but in case any of them are listening, please put a description in the pull request. So it needs a pull request. You know, past that, like, I mean, we're talking about open source projects. That's my background, right? We're talking about volunteer labor. So there's not a whole hell of a lot you can ask for. Like, you want tests. You want code coverage. I think, I think table stakes is to build passes. You know, if your project is large and mature enough and you have enough contributors, we can talk about things like, okay, now, now we must have tests and code coverage and we must, you know, have a a certain people reviewing it and and all those sorts of things. But, you know, in small and smaller projects and and under-resourced projects, you know, there's only really so much you can expect. You know, the ideal PR is very different from the usual PR. So. Yeah, that's some great insight from a maintainer's perspective. You know, for me, I, I have a lot to say on this topic, a lot to say about all the things we're going to talk about today in general, actually. Code reviews are the most inefficient form of pair programming, right? I mean, if you think about it. And so what you're really trying to accomplish in a PR is, you know, not just get your changes across the wire, but communicate change effectively. And so for me, a good PR is like everything Chris, you know, just said, Plus, it's one set of changes, something that can be, you know, you, I really like to think about the rollback strategy is, you know, especially for change, you know, for when you're touching kind of hairy code, it's like, is this, can this be rolled back easily if I broke something? And so, you know, something that's digestible, you know, so the smaller, the better. Um, I, I know sometimes it's really hard to avoid big PRs, but, you know, keeping them small means that, you know, your, your folks are reviewing it quick. You're getting that feedback that you need quickly. And, you know, you know, some of the most productive teams that I've been a part of have SLAs within the team where they're like, yeah, let's, we want to try to get a PR reviewed, you know, in four hours or less, you know, and, and that's just, that's great because, you know, you're not having to kind of switch context and then go back to something else a day later. And and so PRs getting reviewed quickly means like, you know, you as someone who's submitting the PR, what are you doing to kind of usher that process along? Um, well, one thing I want to call out is like, how many people should be reviewing the code? And I'm curious, I'm curious what you what you think. Yeah, I, I'd say minimum of two, uh, ideally, for like a large scale, you know, production code bases. I, I think it's 
best practice to have have at least two reviewers. I you know ideally minimum of two people who like are part of the owners, you know that like own that part of the code that are familiar with it. You know it, it never hurts to have a ton of reviewers, but you know it it can get really overwhelming to have like 17 people reviewing one pull request. So I think that there is there should be some kind of an upper limit to that, but yeah. more is not more here. I think there's a context here too though, right? Like to Chris, to your situation, right? Like there's a lot of, if you're submitting a pull request in an open source project, some of those projects only have one person who might be available to review the code. Right, but some of them might have 17 or greater. And that's like, there needs to be not only for those projects, you gotta have a cap on how many can, people can do it. And that, that means for some projects, making some hard choices and maybe changing a bit how how power is distributed. But yes, definitely I've run into both problems, you know, where there aren't enough people to review and there are way too many people reviewing the code because, you know, the longer PR stays open, maybe the more people review it and that's not always good. You know, the more people you have to please, like the harder it is to land. So, I mean, it's not to say that any, you know, uh, there are concerns from, you know, any, anybody might raise a valid concern and that's, I'm not discounting that, but like, I don't know. I, I feel like th that is the hard decision you have to make, right? That's the hard choice. Well, and there's an interesting question around that, which is who merges the PR and who decides if a PR or what is the decision point that a PR is ready to merge? And that, and of course, that varies by project too, right? Wait, are people still doing manual merges? Because I mean, GitHub, GitHub auto merge for the win, you know, <laughs> like you get that, you get those minimum reviews and you want to get that automatically merged. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I, well, I know. So that is, that is one approach, right? Is you basically set threshold criteria where you say, mm -hmm. if two people approve this and it passes the build, it gets merged. There are types of changes where that may not be the right approach. So I'm thinking about your rollback criteria, ML. And it's interesting to like think about what types of, of changes are easy to roll back versus hard. I think there are changes in many situations, anything that's touching data and you know, sort of data migrations or things like that, unless you're extremely careful, which maybe at a large enterprise you can be able to do all the time. But in many situations, you'll end up where there's a data change that is hard to roll back. Not necessarily impossible, but it's going to be non-trivial. And those pull requests, I think, might need to be treated a little differently. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. You're right. I was I was being, you know, a little cheeky there, but you're absolutely right. You know, I think that I think for me anyways, as a developer, one of the scariest things, you know, you, you would see sometimes is like, oh, request for changes, you know, and it's something that I wish we had like, I think we, we applied more liberally, you know, like I think that I've noticed that like folks aren't always consistent. Sometimes it's like people will just, re they'll like maybe conditionally approve something or, you know, they'll like formally request changes. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, in cases where you have to iterate, you, you know, that auto merge like can be a bit dangerous, right? So to your point, um, K-Ball, but yeah, so I have some more thoughts on pull requests, but. <laughs> well, one of the things you said there led me in another direction, which is you talked about you know, different people have different approaches to how they give feedback and mm. how they review. Are there different types of feedback or structures or styles that y'all have found to be more or less effective? I mean, if you're a jerk, that's not very effective. So what I do, especially not so much with, with contributors because I take them for granted, like the, <laughs> you know, maintainers, I, I take them for granted, right? They're there. I know they're going to keep maintaining. I don't have to be super nice. So I'm going to, if you're like a first time contributor or you're a new contributor, I'm going to like start with thank you. Like before anything else, it's thank you for this. And then, you know, if it's something that I could see potentially getting merged, then I'll go ahead and actually review the code. It might just start with, we're probably not interested in this for reasons. All right. And if we are interested in it, then, then I can, I can look into the code. And so, I mean, what I do is I ask a lot of questions. It's not so much, I mean, there are, 
you know, this should change for this reason. Perhaps that's like for consistency, but most of my questions are going to be around intent just to make sure I really understand what's being added. And I feel like the questions are good. I think where things fall apart, like especially with first time contributors, is that you might not get an answer. And there's a lot of uh, drive by PRs where people send the PR and then they disappear. And, you know, even if they see it through, they might disappear. But I mean, as a reviewer, certainly I, I feel like asking questions is always good. And not being a jerk is always good. And actually being excessively polite is always good, if possible. But I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious then about how do I respond to a code review? What is, what is a good way to do that? Because, I mean, I don't know. I guess I haven't thought too hard about, like, when I send a PR, you know, what is effective for me? Any ideas? I think reviewing your own PR is one, right? So you'd be surprised at how much you can catch just like looking at your code in a different context than the one that you wrote it in, you know? So just seeing it, you know, in that diff view, um, you know, in, in a different context, it, it really does help. So be your own first reviewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I do that too. And then like you start commenting on your own code and you're like, okay. And you delete the comment and then you go comment the source code and, and you and you update your PR. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, so there's that. And the, the other thing I would say is um, definitely like make sure that you're like linting and doing all the things, you know, before you're really marking something as ready. Right. I mean, so for, for me, like there's certain conversations that are just really not productive to have. And that's just like nits about linting and styling and all the stuff that should just be binary, let the machine deal with it. You know, it's just like a waste of time to argue about, right? So have, you know, set up your rules, agree on it as a team, and then just, you know, don't knit in PRs on stuff like that, because hopefully it should just be part of your like build system. Yeah. A couple of reactions I have as well. So one thing I've seen that can be really useful is you mentioned that when you're reviewing a PR, you do a lot of questions about intent. Some of the best PRs I've received, the person filing the PR actually puts a bunch of, of sort of PR notes about intent, right? Things that may or may not be in the code, though sometimes it makes sense for them to be documentation, but sometimes it doesn't. But they'll call out like, this is intent, this is not. Another thing that I've seen called out, sometimes you can completely separate structural or refactoring changes from content changes. And that's probably better when you can do that. But occasionally you can't separate those into split PRs. And so I've seen people call out where they'll say like, this is one pull request. This set of changes is almost all just structural refactoring. And this set is new logic and just helping guide the reviewer's eyes to the key pieces there. Absolutely. But, okay, so right, a thing that makes that difficult uh, is GitHub. And like, it's easy to look at the PR as a whole in GitHub. It is more difficult if you have like, you can't, it's hard to look at it by change set, right? And so, yeah, and it's, I don't, I don't even know. It's like, you need the context too. And it's like, that's maybe even an un unsolvable problem because you have, if you're looking at a change set and you see it uh, like a formatting change in one, you know, it might be necessary to see the actual like other change set in the same file or whatever. Um, that's part of the, anyway, it's just, uh, it's hard. And, you know, there are companies that build on top of GitHub's PR stuff um, to try to make the, the process better. And I actually use one of them. Um, I could plug it. Uh, it's a company called Graphite, and they do fancy stuff with pull requests and reviews. And it's actually pretty useful. So, yeah. Yeah, I've used Reviewable for that purpose as well. Yeah, and I'd say, like, to your point about you know, breaking up and adding your own comments to PRs to make it easier and di more digestible. And another thing I've seen, you know, work really well for like complex PRs is 
actually setting up a synchronous uh, review with the team and kind of going over it together, you know, on a call and being able to talk through it. And, you know, it's just much more efficient to get that feedback and kind of gauge what's landing well and what isn't, you know, for large, large chain sets when you have a, have it done synchronously. So don't be shy to schedule some time with your team. And I can't believe we haven't mentioned this, but the last fun fact I have about PRs <laughs> is that there's no such thing as a pull request in Git, you know, the whole concept of pull request is just like a patch that's created a git patch and merge and like github creates the interface for what is a kind of quote unquote pull request you're requesting them to pull this change from mm-hmm. your branch yeah but yeah no it is a it is a higher level concept on top of the the core git one other thing i've seen some teams do that i think is useful is kind of codifying the levels of feedback So I was trying to find an article and I couldn't find it, but I've seen somebody that was talking about like boulder, pebble, sand or something as different layers where basic, or I've seen red, yellow, green, basically having a level that is like, this must change for this pull request to be acceptable. Like either this is broken or this is fundamentally wrong in our architecture or what have you. Um, Having another layer that is like, this is a recommended change or I recommend you figure this out. Like I feel pretty strongly about this, but I could be argued out of it or something in, in that kind of middle level. And then a, a lowest level that I've also seen described as nits, right? It's just, this is a minor nit. You could take it, you could leave it. It's not blocking, but making that clear in your feedback because I've seen, you know, we are engineers. Some of us as engineers are very detail oriented. And I have seen folks lay out massive amounts of review feedback on a pull request with no context for which things are really important and which things are, this is a minor quirk that I like, right? And that's really hard to parse as the person submitting the request and say like, okay, you've given me 30 things here. Like what should I focus on? Especially for more junior engineers. And so I think some sort of, even if you don't have a formalized practice in the project, like some amount of like laying out, this is important. This is a nitpick. Yeah, I think that's a, that's great advice. I, I try to do that too. And you know, if rarely will I end up actually like saying, like pressing the red button and being like, no, we can't merge this as is. Uh, most of, most everything is going to be like of the suggestion variety, right? And uh, yeah, I think that's really important too. I wish there was like a better interface for that. But yeah, good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, my style is, is exactly what Cabal just said, like non-blocking, semicolon, you know, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> so it would be really great to see if we could, uh, if there was a way to like have a, a blocking comment versus a non-blocking comment, like right in, in GitHub. That would be really cool. So if you're listening, GitHub, <laughs> some great user feedback coming for you here. Yeah, I feel like the the three states that a PR can be in on GitHub are are it's it it might be insufficient. Like it's I don't know. It's like either yes or no or nothing essentially, right? And so I don't know. It's like I guess you can abuse labels to do that, and people do. But uh. yeah, one of the things that we've sort of started to stray into here in some of our conversation is CI and CI/CD and kind of this this whole area and. So one piece of this is like, what sets of things belong in a pull request review versus being checked by your CI? So what y'all called out stylistic things, like you should just let the machine do that, (laughs) have that all be in a config that CI handles. Are there other things that y'all have seen sometimes handled in PRs that instead should be handled in a CI system? Yeah, like um, asking for missing unit tests, really, we sh- you know, there should just be a threshold there for new code specifically, as well as just in general, right? So you can kind of automate, like you, we, you can't merge this without meeting that threshold. So there's no need to kind of really discuss that synchronously <laughs> or async. Um, so that's one. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's also kind of dependent on the, on the project maturity. Like it may be a lot to ask of, uh, pull request senders to, to do some of these things. Like, for example, maybe there's a functional test that needs to get written and there's no, like, good example of how to do that specific kind of thing in the code base already. And so it just, you know, it can be difficult because 
yeah, I've just I've run into that situation a lot where it's like, okay, here's this new change. You know, I've got this unit test, but I haven't written any sort of like end to end type thing for it because I don't know how and I'm not sure I'm going to have the time to do it or, or whatever. But and then you just kind of deal with that as it as it comes. Maybe that means afterwards you need to create a harness for for whatever to, to help that person. I don't know. But it's, uh, I haven't seen a lot of projects actually enforce like a code coverage percentage in the open source world, but maybe that's just JavaScript. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on the type of project, I, I suppose. I mean, I guess an another one would be really just, you know, kind of a lot of the stuff that developers have to kind of do manually bef to get their you know, the dressing room type of things to get their pull requests ready, right? So having a bot or something that just posts and auto posts comments, and that's not quite CI, but I do think that's like something in between. It's like checking the quality of, of the pull request and just automating that, like you're missing a description or you're missing a screenshot or, oh, you changed this thing. So you need this thing, you know, does this thing need a feature flag or any, you know, whatever else. Right, <laughs> right. So, so like a, a linter for your pull request, right? For your pull request, okay, which yeah. is different from, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've certainly had things like hooks and GitHub Actions type checks for like commit message format, because the stuff that I've worked on recently has all been pretty hardcore into the conventional commit format. And so having things to en enforce that as well. Yeah, we've got a whole thing where it's like, does this thing have a JIRA ticket associated to it, right? Just because like, for compliance reasons, like, you know, you need to be able to track what this change was for, you know? <laughs> so just even things like that are helpful because, you know, humans are human and we, we, we're going to human, right? So humans are human and we're going to human. I love that. Is there a point which is too much in your CI system? I mean, I don't know a team today that isn't struggling with really exceptionally long build times and, you know, how to, how to get around that, you know, that's just a common problem for all kinds of companies. And it's not just like you know, we're compiling TypeScript into JavaScript. It's like all of the things, right? It's the linting, it's the all the different, you know, unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end tests. It's, you know, building for different, um, testing the different screen sizes, you, you name it. Like it's like this expansive kind of pipeline and, you know, it's just this never-ending compute problem. And so, you know, for a lot of folks who, you know, may be working in a monorepo, you know, you may especially be feeling that pain, right? Because... Yeah, it's very real. And there's lots of clever things that lots of clever people are, you know, working on to optimize and use computed caches and you name it, but it's still not perfect. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, there's nothing worse than like having to wait like an hour to like get feedback on your build, you know, so. And then like in my world, it, most of the time, it's just not enough. It's like there are never enough tests. There's never enough the build matrix is too small, you know, stuff like that. Another thing that we're running into is, you know, maybe we don't have as many tests as we should, but the tests that we do have push up against the resources of the, the CI agent or the build agent or whatever. And so, like, it becomes flaky, and then we need to get a bigger one. And then, of course, now we need to pay for that bigger one. And it's just like... And of course, like, you know, some people are probably paying a lot for something in CI and maybe a lot more than they should. I'm not really familiar with that myself, but maybe Amal can speak to it. Have you been looking at my <laughs> credit card bills? <laughs> just like Circle CI, <laughs> NX Cloud. I'm just kidding. No, it's, yeah, no, that's very real. Um, you know, I would say that in terms of kind of optimizations, you know, there's, there's lots of clever things that folks have done to kind of help this. One is, you know, sometimes there's um, this, you know, you can have a dev box in the cloud where, you know, you're developing locally, but, you know, all of your compute's happening in the cloud and that just kind of you're distributing all your stuff and you're getting faster feedback cycles as a result. Another is, you know, leveraging ASTs to really kind of optimize the hell out of your, like all of your build functions, you know, everything from linting to testing to, you know, just knowing what needs to run, you know, so how do we kind of shorten that cycle? You don't need to rerun, you don't need to rebuild every part of your app, right? But yeah, I mean, that's, this is not a problem that I think we've solved well, but I don't know, what, what are your thoughts, K-Ball? 
No, I mean, I think it's it's definitely a challenge. We're we're on this curve still of trying to substitute more and more machine resources for human resources, but the machines aren't getting faster as fast as we want to push more stuff in them. And I see that playing out all over the place. Another question related to this is almost every team I'm aware of at this point is doing CI, continuous integration, where there's some amount of testing and, and things happening when you do a pull request or something like that. Far fewer are doing continuous deployment. Is that something that y'all have done work with or seen work well anywhere? Okay, well, I, uh, like in my land, it is in my land. In the projects that I work on, that looks like basically aut- automated releases, which is just like part of the CI process. There are different strategies there. I guess I don't have enough, like, I know that automatic releases can be a little dangerous, very dangerous, especially if you don't have, if you're not confident in your code coverage and that sort of thing. Like once your your project has been like battle tested enough and, and once you feel confident that it is correct, I think that automatic releases is, is, is probably a much safer bet. But if it's not, if it if there are gaps, I, I think that's not necessarily a, the greatest idea. But other than that, it's just these automated releases. There are several ways to go about it, but that's all I know. I, d- I, don't, I don't deploy stuff. So yeah. you Just release it to NPM. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've kind of worked in places where, it, you know, there's both kind of an automated deployment process as well as like a manual one where there's like a big event or, you know. But I think, you know, the really the healthiest models, I think, for me are just where, you know, you're deploying on every every pull request kind of goes through all the things gets deployed, but you're kind of decoupling releases and deployments, right? So that you have a feature that's behind a flag and you're shipping changes towards that feature. You're it's going into production every single with every single merge. You're kind of de-risking the whole project, you know, as you go along. No big surprises towards the end, right? The code's in production already. It perhaps you're even testing it there uh, for a limited set of users. And once you're ready, all you need to do is turn on a feature flag, which would enable more or less your feature release. And that doesn't have to include code deployment. And so I think just decoupling deployment and feature releases is one. And you know the, the benefit of that is also that as you're deploying frequently and every you know with every merge, you're also able to do the same thing for bugs, right? So if you find an issue in production, it's not this big hoopla, you know, to get it fixed. Like it's it's like how how quick does your CI/CD pipeline run? And that's plus one minute or whatever. <laughs> it's like you know how long it's going to take to get that fixed into production. And so you know having continuous deployment is definitely something teams should try to strive for uh, if you don't already have that. And I think sometimes the hiccup. To towards you know, to getting to that is like, hey, we're not always ready to like, you know, release this thing to a customer. And so that's where, you know, feature flags can really come in to help manage that risk for you. Okay, well, is it, is it appropriate or not to get into the weeds on this? No, I, I actually was going to try to get into the weeds on feature branches and feature flags and things around that. Because I think it used to be common to have like a long lived feature branch and then you'd have challenges with merging and all these different things. But I know there are places that still follow that approach. And then feature flags, as you highlight, ML can be a much better option in some ways, though I think there are also challenges, especially once again, when you start dealing with things like data migrations and data changes. But yeah, Chris, go, because I think you have some weeds you want to dig into. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I am not in the weeds myself, but I'm interested in the weeds. So yeah, feature flags is like a thing that is not like in my wheelhouse, because that's not like... I don't know. Maybe that's a thing that should be because maybe it makes sense for some of these libraries and apps that that I release, you know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Like, what goes into a feature flag? Like, what should I hide behind a feature flag? How do I flip the flag? You know, tell me about feature flags. Yeah, sure. So I guess like in its simplest form, right, it's really just kind of a glorified Boolean check, right? So it's like... If the thing, then do this. If not, do that. And so, you know, you're just kind of, you're looking at like an application property and ideally something that's externally managed so that, you know, you can turn these flags on and off without code deployments. 
But at, at its simplest form, it's really just a Boolean check that facilitates a logic branch. And, you know, typically you would use a feature flag to kind of handle that like work in progress, you know, to hide work in progress or to do some beta testing for a new feature or to, yeah, because you're just, you're not ready to release this into the world fully. Or maybe it's released and you still want to have control over it or you want to be able to turn it off. Like you want to have like a an escape, you know, you want to kill switch basically, All right? So all of those things are enabled by using a feature flag. And, you know, a feature flag doesn't have to always be used for a feature. It could be used for a bug fix. It could be used for anything, anything that you want to have a kill switch or anything that you want to experiment with in the context of like when a user is running it. And I would say Node actually, they're not quite feature flags, but you know, the experiments, you know, run Node with this experimental flag, right? So you you do have those types of things in even runtimes like Node. Yeah, I was gonna say in in like a the web app world, typically it's some sort of database backed service and it might let you roll, you know, depending on are you using a third party service, are you rolling your own, it might be as as simple as a Boolean across the application. It might be some sort of like gradual rollout. You could do feature flags that vary based on user properties or other things like that. I think in the node or CLI kind of world, it's probably like environment variables or things like that, where you're saying, okay, this is the default, but you can override it in this way so we can experiment in these cases. And then at some point, maybe the default flips. Uh, but you still have the ability to disable it by passing this environment variable or something like that. So, I mean, to me, that just sounds, it's just an option, right? It's just like pass dash E to grep or something like that, right? And so is feature flag just like a marketing term then? Like, I mean, because sure, we've always had these things, right? So one difference in like the web world is it's often not controlled by the user, right? It's not a user option in some way. It is, this is something that we can, as the controlling engineers, toggle based on conditions that we care about, which might be, are you a beta user? Which might be, are you an admin? Which might be, are we past some date? Which might be, have we flipped the switch in the database? And and there's usually like an SDK that you import into your project because you're, you're, I mean, some teams roll their own. Like if you have the time and energy to have your own internal tooling that you use to manage feature flags, you can certainly do it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but um, you can. But there's services like LaunchDarkly, Split, Split.io. There's a number of different services that you can use that give you an interface to manage that in a dashboard as well. So like in the stuff I work on, there would be no need for an SDK. Like what do you need that for? In your case, it would be kind of a flag that you would pass in at, like you would potentially pass in that flag when you're running the library or something like that. Like, you know, for a node package, I don't think it would make sense to do this, right? But Unless you want some way to trigger it remotely. <laughs> like maybe, <laughs> yeah. which which actually I could imagine if you're interfacing oh. with a backend system or something like that. So something like LaunchDarkly is going to give you like a web UI to manage your flags and add new ones and toggle them on and off from a centralized place or something like that, right? And and like manage experiments and things like that, right? Like so that's that is another thing that often gets in some ways rolled up together with feature flags is like doing this as as an A/B test. You know, can we roll this out to a set of people based on some sort of random distribution and gather data and then make decisions and and sometimes even like automatically ramp up and down who gets to use this based on some sort of other data in the system? Yeah. And and one of the for me, like to put it colloquially, like when feature flags are very in clutch, right, is they come in clutch when you're working at scale and you want to do a slow roll up for a feature, right? You're like, I don't want to turn on this whole new credit card processing workflow, for example, for every everyone all at once. I want to have it be on for 5% of traffic. And then I'm going to monitor my error logging and check to see if like nothing is going crazy. And then maybe an hour or two hours or a day later, you bump it up to 20% and so forth. And so it lets you do a slow roll up as well, right? So um, Cable is talking about monitoring, like usually the thing that you're really looking at is error logs is the system, you know, and you're looking at your like your observability stack to see like, hey, is everything still okay? Is this thing working as I expected to? Or if you're in e-commerce, you're looking at purchases, right? Like 
Does turning this on dramatically reduce the number, the amount of money people are sending our way? Right, right. Yeah, that, exactly. You know, um, so both from a customer behavior perspective, but also when you're rolling out infra changes that can or, or changes that can have a heavy impact on your infrastructure, you're, you're just making sure that like everything is OK. So I want to loop back to something that got mentioned earlier when we were talking about CICD a little bit and about PRs, which is tickets. Amel, you talked about, oh, we you know want this linked to a Jira ticket or, or what have you. I think you know open source world, a lot of times it's just issues, people filing things. But some of the things I wanted to talk about here is best practices for what should go into a ticket and how we should interact with it. So first off, like how much detail goes into a ticket? I don't think there could be enough detail because <laughs> um, that's usually like most of the time people have an opposite problem. I, I mean, this is so subjective, right? It's like, how big is your team? How mature is your team? How long have you all been working on this product? How long have you all been working on together? There's so many factors that go into like where this dot lands of detail, right? Because I've seen tickets are just like a title, right? And it's like, and it's, you know, someone picks it up because they know exactly what needs to be done. Sometimes there's cases where there's a lot more bureaucracy around like tickets and details and, you know, and so company culture also plays a lot into it. But I think for me at minimum, you know, as an engineering lead, like I like to think about lowest common denominator. And for me, it's, you know, can anybody on the team pick this up? Like new or seasoned senior or junior, like, does this have enough detail for that new person to like know what? what to do with it. Like, I think that's a good North star. That's interesting. Like, I mean, sometimes it seems like you might as well just do it if you have to add that much description. You know what I mean? See, it's like I said, it's subjective. Yeah. And it's, I think one of the, the keys here is how do you know it's done? Right. And if you can label, this is what done looks like. I, one way I've seen that is acceptance criteria. These things are happening. Or if the ticket is a bug, it's like this thing broke. It shouldn't be broken, right? And there you do want enough detail to reproduce the bug for sure. And that's a place I think, Chris, where maybe this is helpful. If like you want all the detail necessary to get to a repro, even if the person who's reporting this ticket or issue has no idea how any of the pieces underneath that are going to work. Because that reproduction information, and I know this is maybe an unrealistic ask for most open source users, but that's what gets you to the point where you can just pick this up and run with it. Right. Yeah. There's the Stack Overflow's like minimal viable example. I use the copy and paste that URL all the time. It describes like how to show a reproducible example with, with some code or something. And that's the gold standard. That that is the North Star, as you would say, right? It's that's what we that's what we want from any bug report is just show me the quickest way and easiest and, and most minimal way to reproduce this so we can fix it. But that mostly doesn't shake down like that, right? It's uh, it runs the gamut from it doesn't work to like you know in the in the best case it's something it's you know somebody just like. Well, I can't show you the code because it's proprietary or here's this huge repo that you can check out. You know, it's about the best you can hope for. Got to love those bug reports that are just, it doesn't work. Mm, yeah, it doesn't work. Which, which it? What were you trying mm -hmm. to do? Fix it. Fix it and fix me while you're at it, you know? And actually, like, my kitchen sink's kind of leaky if you want to come over, you know? It's just like, it's like, gee, yeah, no, it's, um, bug reports are, are, are the toughest. And, and I think it's, Something that's like understated with bug reports is just like what version of the software were you running when when you observed this issue, and you know what browser were you running? <laughs> like, all, there's so many things that you also want to know in order to kind of like pinpoint if this is even still a valid bug. Because sometimes maybe the last Chrome update fixed this bug. You know, <laughs> it's like maybe this wasn't even my bug to begin with, right? So um, yeah, we started using the forms, GitHub's forms for bugs, like because they had the issue templates first, which is cool. But then they added forms, and it's like, wow, we can just have people fill in uh, all the information here, and that's helpful. That is, yeah. But uh, I skip them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what about when you're working on an issue? Um, and this may be more relevant in Amel's world than than yours, Chris, but like 
say there's a customer reported issue working in that you're working on, you pick it up. What types of updates make sense to post back? What goes back to that ticket in between, all right, I'm working on this, where you you know click the assign to me and it's shipped? Like updates along the way. Yeah, I, I would say, um, so one is like, you know, typically for teams I've worked on, you know, we, we have kind of like a definition of ready and a definition of done. And so, you know, definition of ready is like, you know, when is this like this bug ticket and or feature ticket, like when is this ready to be worked on, right? Like for bugs, like it's, you know, when we have enough detail to be able to reproduce it, et cetera. Yada, yada, yada. For, you know, for feature tickets, it's, you know, when we have acceptance criteria, when we have, you know, maybe designs, you know, we've got, like there's a number of, of, of things that go along the way, you know, and typically, you know, if you're fixing a bug, you know, it's good etiquette once the bug is fixed to just like tag the person who filed the bug to say, oh, you know, bugs fixed now and it's shipped, it's going to be in the next release or it's already out in production or whatever, or it's merged into main. That's good. You want to have them be able to like retest it and revalidate it and make sure that it's like actually fixed. Um, you know, so that's one. And, and in terms of kind of when you're working on something that's like a product feature or just an enhancement, you know, typically you have a product owner, or product manager, or someone on your team that's really driving that direction and strategy that is going to kind of give you that like kind of product acceptance, so to say, right? And so like, yeah, the, maybe it's your designer, maybe it's your product manager, maybe it's your tech lead, you know, whoever that is, you know, someone else is validating the thing to say, yeah, this this works. And so typically, you know, you'd review that at the end of your sprints or w- whatever iteration cycle you use to, to say like, ta-da, I did the thing, you know, that I said I was going to do and it's done, so. Interesting. I'm going to put a couple more things in there that I've seen or used at different times. So one is for customer reported issues. Oftentimes, whoever is managing customer support needs to be able to respond back to the customer and let them know. And so I think, you know, the ready, like this is ready. We're starting on it is good. Communicating some sort of timeline. But especially for higher priority or more urgent things, I have found that having some sort of cycle of updates of just like, I am looking at, I am still working on this. We have not figured it out or it is not done yet, but there is progress being made. <laughs> and your team can agree on what that cadence is, but you know, oftentimes for a very urgent issue, like it might be once a day or even once, you know, for something that's blocking large numbers of your users using it once an hour, right? Almost like incident level updates, but expanding that out into larger timeframes for things that are less intense or, or incredible, but just like, hey, this is still in progress. I'm still working on it. It still has attention. Because I found a lot of times customer success or, or customer support, like they get anxious, right? Like they're getting bombarded with questions and it's a black box. They're like, I know that they said they're going to work on this, but I haven't heard anything for three days. Like, I don't know what to say to someone. And so providing just, even if it's that brief update, end of the day, we're on target, planning to have it done by end of week, whatever. End of the day, still working on this, like it's coming, can be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my world, you know, I'm a big, big enterprise now. Uh, I'm in back in enterprise land. And it's, you know, typically we have like different severities for bugs, right? Sev one, two, three, four, whatever. And so, if it, yeah, if you're working on something that requires that level of communication, which I, from what you're describing, I would consider like to be like a sev one or two bug, uh, you know, y- there's definitely, especially for sev one, like there's, you know, kind of a war room opened up and people are pinging you for updates. So like that happens whether you like it or not. <laughs> so, well, it's nice to have a central location, right? So you're not having sure. to get pinged by the five people who care about this. You're like, Absolutely. go look at the ticket. It's up yeah. to date. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Keeping, I mean, that's that's a good hygiene period, I, I think. And I, I stress that for my team all the time is like, you know, any updates that are like really noteworthy, you know, whether they're, in, you know, for incidents or not, like you should even for feature tickets, like put a note, kind of be remote first, truly, right? Like put it in the ticket, put it in the issue ticket, like leave a log of your, of your updates. And I think on, on that same note, you know, great practice to start draft PRs for work in progress. You know, um, it's a good way to just communicate to the team, like what direction you're taking and how, you know, what approach you're, what you're taking. And, you know, you let people kind of give you early feedback. You let people you know, follow along, you know, that's another kind of commun- way to kind of share updates to K-Ball's point. Draft PRs, they're great. Totally. 
Well, and like those high level, you know, to Chris's point earlier, right? Different things are at different levels of abstraction. And especially with more senior folks, like it may not be spelled out in lots of detail. What are the pieces that's going to make this done? It may be a very high level, like we need this feature or we need this thing. Here's what, you know, how we'll know it's done. Here's some acceptance criteria. But that thing may have like five or 10 or, or a bunch of different things inside of it, may have a bunch of unknowns. And a practice that I've used and that I definitely recommend to folks is like, once I'm, when I'm figuring those things out, I will just keep a, a trail in the ticket as comments of like, okay, I'm looking at this section. It looks like it's going to need this, this, and this. I'm looking at this. Here's the thing that I'm struggling with. Here's what I know. And just kind of like keep a log of what I'm figuring out as I go in that ticket. And it's useful for a couple reasons. Like the main audience for those updates is me, right? That's helping me keep track. If this thing is large enough that I can't keep it all in my head at once, or I'm like having to build up an understanding, that's helping me keep track of what I'm figuring out over time. The secondary audience is, as you highlight with the draft PRs, it gives people a chance to jump in. No, that doesn't look quite right. I don't think that's the right way to think about it. Or like, yeah, that's that totally seems correct. Or this seems like something we did in this other place. Go check that out. You know, those sorts of things. The third reason is it gives the opportunity for other people to pick it up if for some reason something else comes in and takes me off of this, right? Like I'm working on this feature, I'm going on it. Oh my gosh, there's an incident. I'm off on this. And then I got pulled in this other direction, but we still need that to happen, but I'm the best person to be working on this incident. So can someone else pick it up? Now there's a whole log of the learning and thinking that's already gone into that, that somebody else can take and start running with. Totes. Totes my goats. Okay, ball. I feel like I should like, you know, can I get an amen? You know, we need like a, a little choir for you today. But yes. Any other things about tickets before we move on? I mean, is it a ticket or is it an issue? I mean, can we just make up our minds about this? I feel like ticket is more generic sounding <laughs> in some ways. Like issue sounds like there's something wrong, but I might just be asking for something. You know, it's really funny that you say that, K-Ball, because believe it or not, this is like many, many years ago. Yeah, maybe like, I don't know, almost almost 10 years ago now, someone was trying to pick out an open source library. And they were like, you know, this tool versus that tool. And, you know, and this was, you know, earlier days of GitHub. And basically, this person was like, I don't know, you know, this, this library seems great. But you know, I'm looking at all the open issues. And I'm thinking like, maybe this isn't like, this doesn't have the best quality. And I was I remember thinking like, hmm, yeah, I don't know, like, you know, that like, I guess maybe, you know, and then like coming back to that, like conversation a few years later, thinking like, oh, wait a second, actually, like number of issues is not like a metric for looking at a project's quality. Actually, like the high number of issues is actually kind of, I think, I don't know, I think it's a good thing. People care, there's activity, there's stuff going on. I think a metric that would be great to, to see is like how many of these issues have been closed and completed, you know? <laughs> But like, lifespan of an issue because they're just like piling up you know that's like but but yeah so I, it's uh, yeah issue is um especially for language people coming in from yeah different languages that's very very loaded so yeah i uh couldn't agree with you more so i don't know to be decided i guess chris you look like you have a take oh well i you know i was, I was thinking about the, the the issue count thing and then like you can say all these things and make all these assumptions, but then you look at the way JDD used to run Lodash and it was issue zero and it was one of the most widely used libraries, right? And so you can't look at the issue count and say it was popular mm. because it was really popular, but he didn't want issues open. So he closed them all, right? <laughs> Not that he fixed them all. He closed just closed them all. No, I mean he probably fixed them all too. But like it's uh it's not even a thing you can it doesn't mean anything. Mm. Issue count doesn't mean anything, I think, is is what I'm getting at. Well, I feel like there's a lot of other topics we could talk about for dev process, but we've been going for an hour and I think we've covered a lot of ground. So might be about time to wrap. Any closing thoughts you all want to leave people with? Yeah, I I guess for me, it's just, you know, software is a social sport. You know, we think about software as this thing that is an isolated experience, and it's very far from that, you know. And so 
whatever we can do to kind of optimize, you know, our connection points with others, you know, whether it's communicating through, you know, more effectively in our pull request comments or being more descriptive in the way we write code, you know, optimizing for the human, not the machine, right? All, all those things, you know, they really go a long way. And so I think, you know, kind of anything we can do to change our thinking so that, you know, we're thinking about software as a social sport, I think goes towards, I think, improving all the things that we were talking about today. So Yeah, I think as enterprises and, and, and businesses adopt more and more open source and then start hand-wringing about the state of open source security and all, all sorts of other things around the ecosystem, the way to ensure that these open source projects adopt the best practices and, and norms that a business or enterprise would be used to is to have more of your employees work on those open source projects and contribute to them because that's the only way it's going to happen. You can't squeeze you know, water from a stone or what have you. The people that maintain these projects it might look pretty hinky from your point of view because there there aren't all these guarantees and there there isn't a bunch of checks and and uh, assurances that you would hope there would be because there aren't enough people to put them there and there aren't enough people to maintain them. So I would love to see some of these other best practices that come from industry apply to open source projects, but the only way to do that is we is we need more contributors. It won't, it won't happen externally. It won't happen through a grant. Like, it won't happen through awareness. It will only happen through more contributors, more maintainers, and more investment in the open source ecosystem by businesses. I think that is a great place to wrap us. This is JS Party. I am K-Ball. And thank you, Amel. Thank you, Chris. Bone Skull. I, I never know which to call you because Bone Skull is so good good, but it doesn't roll off the tongue. But thank you. And uh, we'll catch you all next week. We have some awesome episodes coming soon. A debate about debugging? Is console.log all you need? Or do real devs use debuggers? Front end feud returns soon as well. CSS podcast will defend their crown against... No spoilers yet. But I'll say, the challenging podcast initials are WWW. And of course, we have some amazing guests lined up as well. Subscribe to the pod so you don't miss out. Head to jsparty.fm for all the ways. And while you're there, check that box to get changelog news delivered to your inbox every Monday. It's brief, entertaining, and always on point. Thanks once again to our partners for helping us bring you awesome pods each and every week. Check them out at fasty.com fly.io and typesense.org and of course to our beat freaking residents breakmaster cylinder thank you bmc that's it this one's done but we'll be back in your ear holes next week but prs you know it's like the most inefficient form of code root like i would say sorry i'm gonna start over prs are like the most inefficient form of PR reviews. Oh, I'll start over. PR reviewing or code. Co I'm gonna start over. Code <laughs> reviews. Code reviews. Oh my god, this is. You guys are horrible. You're making me laugh. Um. All right. So co PR? code reviews are code reviews. <laughs> Sorry, I'm. I'll. I'll just oh shut up god. here. I'll. I'll. I'm gonna turn myself off. Wait, I think we have some recordings for this. What? What? Thank you. <laughs>